Bandings are an inevitable part of any trading card game, no matter how much a company tries to avoid them. Sometimes cards are printed that are just a little bit too much for format for one reason or another. What cards should or shouldn't be banned are a constant topic of discussion in the community, and today we're going to go over a few of the suspects and talk about why they might end up getting hit by the ban hammer sooner rather than later. Starting us off at number 10, we have the One Ring. This is a legendary artifact with a mana cost of 4. It has indestructible, meaning it can't be destroyed by effects. When it enters the battlefield, if it was cast, you gain protection from everything until your next turn. This means you can't be targeted, enchanted, or dealt damage by anything. At the beginning of your upkeep, you lose life equal to the number of burden counters in the one ring, and you can tap it to put a burden counter on it, and then draw a card for each burden counter on it. This is from the newest set release at the time of writing, Lord of the Rings Tales of Middle Earth. Whenever a new set comes out, there's usually a lot of hubbub around how broken all the new cards are, and how they're going to ruin everything, and then it immediately becomes clear that everyone was exaggerating. However, when the One Ring release and people were able to put into the decks and experiment in a variety of formats, they immediately realized that it was a legitimately powerful card. The One Ring's ability to stop you from taking any damage at all until your next turn is a lot stronger than it may look at first, and the card draw mostly speaks for itself. The only real concern with the One Ring is if you'll actually be able to cast it at a reasonable time in a game as you do have to have it in play for a couple of turns to really get much value off of the card. However, players have found multiple ways to get around this. The most obvious is to simply produce more mana, which is why the card has started to see play in decks like Urza Tron and Modern, a deck whose claim to fame is being able to reduce 7 mana on turn 3. Additionally, it also sees playing Amulet Titan, a deck built around making as much mana as you can with Amulet of Vigor and Bounce Lands. However, even without being able to produce extra mana, if you're able to make the game go long, the One Ring is still a very powerful option. It's also seen play in various decks in Legacy. In fact, it's kind of hard to find a deck the card hasn't been at least tried at this point, with basically just a few combo and aggro decks that could never make the card work skipping over it. This is, without a doubt, a bit of a new toy syndrome. When new things come out, there's a rush to see how they can best be used. But in this case, the card has already put up some results already. Considering how difficult the card is to interact with thanks to both having built-in protection and protecting you, on top of how much card advantage the card can generate, it can be very difficult to play around the card. There's very little counterplay to the One Ring, and if it keeps seeing as much play as it is right now, and that's a very big if, to be clear, but if it does, it may need a ban simply for the sake of format diversity. Now, it's certainly far too early to make any definite statements yet, but considering how topical the card is, it's worth bringing the card up, if only at the lowest spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Violent Outburst. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1, 1 red, and 1 green, and it has the effect where creatures you control get plus 1, plus 0 until the end of turn. But the part of the card that matters is the Cascade ability. This is a triggered ability where, whenever you cast a spell, you exile cards from top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less than this card. You put all the other cards in the bottom of your library in a random order, then you cast that card you hit without paying its mana cost. Cascade is a very powerful ability, to the point that another Cascade card, Bloodbrain Elf, was banded modern for a long time just because of how much value the card could get you. This isn't how Cascade cards are used nowadays, however. You see, there are a ton of powerful applications of these kinds of Cascade cards. Currently, the cards are being used to hit Crashing Footfalls to make two 4-4s four with Trample. This is a sorcery with no mana cost, meaning you actually can't cast it from your hand. Normally, you're supposed to suspend the card and cast it that way, but if you reveal the card off your Cascade trigger, you can just cast it that way and get the 4-4s four for 3 mana. In order to make this card work consistently, you simply need to not play any cards in your deck that cost less than 2 mana, which is a very big deck building cost, but it's proven to be worth it. This is a common theme amongst how Outburst has been used, usually being played in decks with only a couple of cards that you want to hit off of it for some sort of combo. This has actually gotten other cards banned. The card T-Bolt's Trickery counters a spell and then basically lets its controller cascade into another spell with a different name. So, what the deck would do is cast an Outburst in a deck with the only viable target being Trickery. Trickery would counter the Outburst and then spin into another big bomb you wanted to cast, usually something like Emrakul the Eons Torn because it's always Emrakul. It also saw play with another T-Bolt card, Valky, God of Lies, slash T-Bolt, Cosmic Imposter. This was thanks to how the old modal dual face cards rules worked. Valky was a 2-mana creature that you could cast off of Cascade, and since that was the front face of the card, it was what the Cascade checked. However, once it was time to actually cast the card, the way the rules of the time worked was that you got to choose whether to cast the front or back half of the card. This means you could cast a Cascade spell and cast T-Bolt, Cosmic Imposter, a 7-mana Planeswalker, for just 3 mana. Outburst has been used in all of these strategies, and the main reason why people use it instead of any of the other various 3-mana Cascade spells is specifically because it's an instant. To be more specific, it's the only 3-mana Cascade spell that's an instant. 
Banning Violent Outbursts would do a ton to rein in any more combo decks like this that get printed into format, as being able to do these combos at instant speed is a huge part of what makes them so good. Now, Outburst isn't currently an issue. Footfalls is a good deck, but it's not broken. The main reason this card is on this list is that it's already proven itself as a card that's very easy to break, and very easy for wizards to accidentally break at some point in the future. It's a card that legitimately does limit future design space for cards, so it wouldn't be surprising at all to see the card banned at some point in the future. And at number 8, we have Murktide Regent. This is a 3-3 dragon with a mana cost of 5 and 2 blue. It has delve, meaning you can exile cards from your graveyard to pay for the spell. Each card you exile paying for 1 generic mana. It has flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach. It enters a battlefield with a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it for each instant or sorcery card you exile with it. Whenever an instant or sorcery card leaves your graveyard, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. This card started seeing a ton of play as soon as it was printed. Delve is a powerful keyword to the point that putting it on any spell will instantly make the card far more powerful. Murktide may say it costs 7 mana, but it actually only costs 2. It's very easy to get 5 or more cards into your graveyard in older formats. Murktide has basically been the premier threat for blue deck since its release, seeing play alongside a suit of other beaters in Modern and Legacy. In Modern, it sees play with Dragon Rage Channeler and Ledger Shredder and the Channeler and Delver of Secrets in Legacy, and both of these decks basically try to do the exact same thing. They're powerful temple decks that play cheap, powerful threats and protect them with counter magic while removing your own threats. Both Murktide and Channeler were both printed in Modern Horizons 2, a set designed to inject powerful cards into the Modern format, and the printing of these cards made Azet Tempo a deck in Modern overnight. The deck had always been viable in Legacy, where Delver was propped up by powerful counter magic like Force of Will and Days. But without those cards in Modern, the deck had never been good enough. However, the extra power from Murktide Regent and Channeler instantly made the deck a mainstay in the format. Now, some would argue that Channeler is the bigger issue. The card has even been nerfed in Magic Arena, only becoming a 3-1 instead of a 3-3 like its paper counterpart. However, Murktide probably represents a larger issue overall, mostly due to its color. Blue isn't exactly famous for having the best beaters around. It's generally the color with the worst creatures in terms of stats. While blue decks can have nice, efficient creatures, they have to jump through hoops for them. Cards like Cryptic Serpent can be large threats, but require you to have a lot of instants and sorcerers in your graveyard to be cast consistently. Murktide pushes this balance a bit too far, giving blue access to a 5-5 or 6-6 flyer without many questions that can get even bigger throughout the course of a game. Murktide has already shown itself to be a meta-warping card, and giving the one color most defined by its lack of efficient creatures one of the most efficient creature threats in the game can lead to a lot of issues with color balance in the future. And those two factors combined could easily push the card into problem territory. And at number 7, we have Unholy Heat. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 red. It has the effect where it deals 2 damage to target creature or planeswalker. It also has Delirium, giving it a bonus effect if you have 4 or more card types amongst cards in your graveyard. In this case, it deals 6 damage to target creature or planeswalker instead. This is one of the most efficient removal spells currently available in the game, mostly due to just how easy it is to get Delirium online. Getting 4 card types in your graveyard is much easier than it sounds, largely due to how many cheap cards there are that put cards in your graveyard as part of their own effects. The combination of fetch lands, instants, and sorceries with naturally putting themselves into the graveyard, and cards like Mishra's Bauble, which costs 0 mana, sacrifices itself as part of its own effect and draws a card, altogether allow you to have 4 different card types into the graveyard, and pretty quickly, and without your opponent interacting with your board at all. The thing that makes the card ban worthy is, similar to Murktide, how Unholy Heat bends the color pie a bit too much. Heat can basically answer any threat in the game that doesn't have indestructible or some other protection ability. 6 damage is just so much that it's basically a hard removal spell, and this sort of gets around one of red's major weaknesses as a color. Burn spells are supposed to let red get access to efficient removal, burn only for cards within their burst range. Cards with high enough toughness have always been able to survive red's burn effects, and in fact formats are often defined by what threats can and can't survive red's best burn spells. Having 4 toughness is a huge deal specifically because it means your creature survives Lightning Bolt, one of Red's best cards and one of the best cards in the game generally. Heat dealing 6 damage makes it able to clear basically any threat your opponent plays with very few exceptions. Even huge, expensive spells like Primeval Titan die to a single Heat. This means that Heat is, essentially, a hard removal spell for a color who's not supposed to have any, or at least any without some additional downsides. This has already been recognized as a problem by Wizards of the Coast to some degree, as on Arena, the card has been nerfed to only dealing 4 damage when the Delirium is up. The combination of this being just a bit too strong of a removal spell, alongside it being such a color pie bend, makes the card a lot more likely to be hit at some point in the future. And at number 6, we have Gigantha the Wellspring. This is a 5-5 Elemental Alloc with a mana cost of 4 and 1 hybrid red-green mana. This can be paid with either red or green. It has the ability where you can tap it to add 1 mana of each color, but you can only spend this mana to pay colored mana costs. 
so you can't pay the generic portion of a cost with this mana. And finally, the card has Companion. This means that if you meet the card's companion requirement, you can reveal it from your sideboard at the start of the game. Then, at sorcery speed, you can pay 3 mana to put it from your sideboard into your hand. Gigantha's companion requirement is that no card in your deck has a mana cost with more than one mana symbol of the same kind in its cost. So, you can't play cards like Phyrex and Obliterator, but can play cards like Kiora's Follower. The companions are some of the most heavily disliked cards Wizards has ever printed, and several companions have already been banned in multiple formats. The most infamous is Loras of the Dream Den, a card that was so broken released before the errata to the entire companion mechanic to nerf it, that it was banned in Vintage for power level reasons. Vintage's thing as a format is specifically that cards do not get banned, and instead get restricted to one copy. All this to say is that Companion is kind of an issue on its own, but why exactly? The main reason is that there just isn't a big enough cost to play in a Companion. Most of the time, decks will play Companion specifically because they don't have to change their deck much, if at all, to play them. At that point, it's basically a free 8th card in your opening hand every game that's just kind of really expensive. Gigantha is one of the worst examples of this, as the card sees a lot of play in kind of random decks just because they happen to already meet the card's requirement. The card sees play in several formats across a wide variety of decks, such as Rakdos Sacrifice and Pioneer. It sees play in Urza Tron and Modern, since most of the cards they play are completely colorless anyway. And it sees play in various builds of decks like Domain Zoo and Modern. This is only a small snapshot of the decks Gigantha sees play in. The main bannable offense here is just being unfair that certain decks start off with a massive advantage for essentially no reason. This is the main reason the community at large dislikes Companions so much. It leads to awful play patterns and homogenizes the format by literally forcing players to forego more creative deck building and just stick to cards that happen to work with their Companion of choice. Gigantha is the easiest companion to play, and is therefore the only one with the most eyes on it, but most players would be fine with just banning all of the companions at this point. Four out of the ten companions are banned in some format already, and when mechanic has a ban rate of 40%, at some point you have to recognize the mechanic itself is the issue. And at number five, we have Experimental Synthesizer. This is an artifact with a mana cost of one red. It is the abilities where, whenever it enters or leaves a battlefield, you exile the top card of your library. You can play that card until the end of turn. You can also pay 2 and 2 red to sacrifice it to make a 2 2 white samurai creature token with vigilance, meaning it doesn't have to tap to attack, but you can only activate this ability as sorcery. This card isn't quite good enough for most formats, but it's found a home in Popper, a format comprising almost entirely of commons. In Popper, cards are generally less powerful, and the format is more based on finding powerful interactions between cards rather than relying on the power of certain individual cards. Synthesizer has a ton of applications in the format, and a ton of cards that interact very favorably with Synthesizer. Various decks that combine Synthesizer with cards like Improvised Club and Goldal the Rebirth are instants for sorceries that can sacrifice a Synthesizer as a part of their cost. Club can deal 4 damage to anything, and Rebirth makes 3 1 1 tokens for a single mana both of which are incredibly powerful effects for the mana cost. This is how the card has been used in mono red aggro decks, though the card has also seen play in other decks such as Boral Synthesizer, a deck built around the card. This deck uses Glinthawk and Core Skyfisher to bounce a Synthesizer back to your hand with their Enter the Battlefield triggers. Both of these cards are notably above rate for their mana cost in the format, and their Enter the Field triggers being a downside meant to balance them. Synthesizer turns this downside into a massive upside, so it's no wonder that it's proven to be a powerful strategy in the format. Synthesizer's power is a bit worrying, mostly because it's just a little too good at drawing you extra cards. There are other powerful draw spells in the format, but most of them aren't quite this efficient. Given how people are building their entire decks around this card, it's pretty obvious that it's quite a bit stronger than other draw spells in the format. The main problem with the card is that it might get to the point where it's just a bit too easy to proc. The main thing holding Synthesizer back is that you have to pay 3 whole mana to crack it and get the second card, so you need a second card to make it leave the field without paying the cost. The thing is, most of the cards it's being paired with were already incredibly powerful. Most of these cards were already seen play in format, and Synthesizer slotted in perfectly as a way to give these decks a much better draw engine. As more cards like this get printed, Synthesizer will only get easier and easier to use, to the point where it's not even a real deck building cost at all. If things keep going that way, a ban may be in order. And at number 4, we have Shieldred the Apocalypse. This is a 4-5 legendary Phyrexian Praetor with a mana cost of 2 and 2 black. It has Death Touch, meaning any amount of damage it deals to a creature is enough to destroy it. It has the abilities where, whenever you draw a card, you gain 2 life, and whenever an opponent draws a card, they lose 2 life. Shieldred has proven to be a menace in multiple formats, seeing play in every format all the way back to Legacy. A 4 mana card seeing play in Legacy is a pretty good indication of just how powerful it is when it comes down. If you don't answer Shieldred right away, it becomes very difficult to play around. Punishing you for drawing cards makes digging for answers very difficult, and the life gain makes trying to ignore it and end the game equally hard to pull off. 
This is a lot easier to deal with than more powerful formats, but in Pioneer, and more so than anything else standard, the card is backbreaking. Shieldred is one of the most powerful threats for Black and Pioneer, seeing play in most fair decks at the top end threat. There, it's really powerful, but it's not quite problematic right now. However, in Standard, it's a different story. Shieldred is seeing play in several of the best decks in the format. The deck to beat right now is Black Red Midrange, a deck that plays a bunch of powerful threats removal to overpower their opponent no matter what they're doing and Shieldred will usually end the game when it comes down. This is true in all of the decks that sees play in, like Demir, Blue-Black, Midrange, or Esper, also known as White-Blue-Black Control. Shieldred is one of the reasons why Black is considered one of the best colors currently in Standard. This is such an issue that several Black cards have already been banned from the Standard to rein the color in. The Meat Hook Massacre and Invoke Despair were both banned thanks to doing way too much to either let black decks stabilize or give them far too much value for just 5 mana respectively. Even with two of the color's best cards banned, Shieldred has made black debatably the best color in the format. Shieldred still has some time left in Standard, and it may even prove itself to be too much for Pioneer in time. It's a lot more likely to get hit in Standard than it is anywhere else though. And at number 3, we have Karn the Great Creator. This is a Planeswalker with a mana cost of 4 and a starting loyalty of 5. It has a static ability where the activated abilities of your opponent's artifacts can be activated. You can plus one him to make up to one target artifact become an artifact creature with power and toughness equal to its mana value until your next turn. You can also minus two him to choose an artifact card you own in exile or in your sideboard and reveal it and put it into your hand. Karn is a very powerful card that does a lot of things for the decks it's in. The main draw of the card is its ability to pull cards out of your sideboard. This is an effect known as wishing, and it's proven to be very good in the right situations. The main use for the effect is creating a small toolbox of cards that you can grab whenever they'll be useful, without having to draw the matchups where they're not as good. Karn is one of the reasons that the One Ring is seeing so much play, actually. It allows you to find the One Ring exactly when its abilities are the most useful, and never have to risk drawing in bad matchups for the card. On top of giving you this versatility, Karn breaks one of the biggest rules of the game. It gets cards back from exile. This is something that only two other cards in the entire game can even do, Risk Sweeper and Pull from Eternity. And neither of these cards put the unexiled card in a useful zone for you, only shuffle it back into the deck or dump it into the graveyard. Some people will try to, um, actually me here, but every other card that grabs cards from exiles has very specific conditions for what cards I can interact with. Cards like Runic Repetition can only specifically return cards with flashback to your hand, whereas Karn can grab literally any artifact. This means that exiling the cards Karn finds isn't the definite answer it usually is. This is even worse in the case of Karn because it means that they'll be more free to run one copy of each target they want to find and be assured that they'll be able to use them in each game. With other wish cards, exiling the card your opponent wishes for will usually prevent them from being able to use it again in that game, if they're only running a single copy of the card, which they usually will be. Karn gets around this weakness entirely. In fact, it actually synergizes with cards that exile themselves as part of their own abilities, like Stasis Coffin. This is only the tip of the iceberg with Karn. It also got the card Mycosynth Lattice banned in Modern. This card basically turns all permanents into artifacts, which means that with Karn's ability to lock down your opponent's activated abilities and their artifacts, stopping them from being able to tap land for mana. Currently, the place where Karn is the most problematic is in Pioneer, where it sees play in mono green ramp decks. Karn allows the deck to find the best artifacts for whatever deck they're playing against, which with all their extra mana will usually be a very powerful card. We can go on for over an hour in regards to all the problems with Karn, but the combination of how powerful its first two abilities can be, alongside how the versatile it's minus two is, make it extremely problematic in any deck that can produce a good amount of mana. And at number two, we have Fury. This is a 3-3 elemental incarnation with a mana cost of three and two red. It has double strike, meaning it deals first strike damage before all other creatures deal damage and normal combat damage. Whenever it enters the battlefield, it deals four damage divided as you choose amongst any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. It also has Evoke, exile a red card from your hand. Evoke is an alternative cost where if you cast a spell with its Evoke cost, you have to sacrifice it when it enters the battlefield. So, you can cast Fury for no mana by just exiling a red card from your hand, but then it will force you to sacrifice itself, so you only get the enter the battlefield trigger and not the body. This is basically a version of the card Pyrokinesis, which deals 4 damage divided amongst creatures, and can also be free cast by exiling a red card from your hand. Pyrokinesis is a very strong card, and Fury has proven to be just as powerful if not more so in its time in the format. Fury has, basically all on its own, made playing creature-based decks almost completely unviable. Putting too much mana and card advantage into a board that can easily be answered by Fury is a very easy way to lose a game. While some decks do still rely on creatures to try and win, they almost always play very high toughness creatures that Fury can't answer, or play very cheap creatures that it's not as much of a blowout to lose. 
Fury usually preys on decks that want to cast multiple fair threats. The introduction of Fury into a format is one of the reasons why the decks like Five Color Humans and Merfolk have fallen off so hard in more recent years, though that's not entirely Fury's fault. It is, however, a card that preys on these decks far more than any other individual card, which is a strange thing for Wizards to print given that cards like Punishing Fire and Umazawa's Jite are banned specifically thanks to how they punish these kinds of decks. This isn't the end of the problems with Fury though. The card also sees play as part of a very hated deck known as Rakta's Scamp. This is a deck that tries to play Fury and Grief, Grief being the black member of the Evoke Elemental Cycle for the Evoke cost, and then use cards like Feign Death or bring them back to the field when they die. This will let you either rip two cards out of your opponent's hand on turn one, or wipe your opponent's entire board and then end with a powerful threat on the board. This is a widely hated deck that is very difficult to beat if they open the right hand. Getting two cards ripped out of your hand is very hard for most decks to come back from, regardless of the strategy, and having 8 damage thrown at your board is basically impossible for any fair deck to play through. The last area where the card is notably problematic is in Crashing Footfalls decks, which we mentioned earlier. Since this deck has to not play any cards that cost less than 2 mana, it needs to get creative with what spells it plays to interact with your opponent on the first couple of turns of the game. The Pitch Elementals, Fury in particular, take away a ton of the cost of this kind of strategy by allowing them to play powerful interactive spells without breaking any rules for the Cascade Trigger. With all of these issues being present, Fury is a huge target for a possible ban in the future in Modern. And at number 1, we have Urza Saga. This is a Saga enchantment land with no mana cost. How Sagas work is that, whenever they enter the battlefield, and then at the start of your first main phase, you put a lore counter on them and trigger their ability corresponding to the number of lore counters on the card. When you hit the last chapter, you sacrifice the Saga. The first chapter of Urza Saga has its gain the ability, where it can be tapped for 1 colorless mana. On Chapter 2, it gains the ability where you can pay 2 and tap it to make a 0 0 colorless contract artifact creature token with the ability where it gets plus 1 plus 1 for each artifact you control. At Chapter 3, you can search your library for an artifact with a mana cost of 0 or 1, put onto the battlefield, and then shuffle. Saga has several powerful abilities to make it a home run in any deck playing even a few powerful artifacts. The tokens the card produce are incredibly powerful and can be made huge by a deck that plays just a few artifacts, and the ability to tutor for a specific artifact is incredibly strong. Decks have started to include small Urza Saga packages that they can tutor up for the best situation, similar to Karn boards we talked about earlier. One of the decks that Karn sees the most play in is Hammer Time, where you can find the eponymous Colossal Hammer alongside a ton of other useful artifacts. Basically, any deck that played artifacts also played Saga, since Saga just generated far too much value to ignore. Often in Urza Saga is one of the biggest threats your opponent can play, which is a big part of the problem. Of all card types, lands are the most difficult card type to interact with. The cheapest land destruction we get without a massive downside is at 3 mana, and this isn't printed anymore. The best way to interact with lands that most decks will have access to will be cards like Ghost Quarter and Field of Ruin, which both have some big downsides. Ghost Quarter leaves you down a land, and Field of Ruin basically costs 3 mana to activate. In Legacy, this isn't as big of an issue, as the format is basically defined by Wasteland, which can be sacrificed to blow up a non-basic land for no extra mana. However, in Modern, you won't have access to Wasteland or any card that's a suitable replacement for the card. This leads to a huge problem. Urza's Saga is a card that's strong enough to, in several different decks and game states, be able to just win the game, but there's basically no way to interact with it. There's really not even that much you can do to play around Urza's Saga, and trying to play around it too much will actually lower your chances of winning, not increase them. Considering how heavily played Saga is and how little counterplay there is against the card, alongside how it will only get better as it gets more and more good tutor targets, makes it a prime target for a ban in the future. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, please let us know down in the comments below.